break versus continue versus pass. So we tend to use these three keywords occasionally in our for loops or while loops. So let's start off with a list. Apple, orange, pear, pineapple, and durian. And let's just write a simple for loop. For fruit in fruits, green fruit. So each of these keyword does a certain thing. Let's start with the break. So when we break in a loop, the entire loop stops. So let's say if fruit is equals to pair and we break. So let's run this first and we will get apple and orange. So what happens is that we will go to apple and we'll go to orange and then we'll go to pear. And because fruit is equal to pear, it breaks. So nothing else happens after the for loop. Next, let's move on to continue. So for continue, only the current iteration is skipped. So the entire loop does not stop. So let's say if fruit is equal to pear and we continue, and let's run this again, and we get apple, orange, pineapple, and durian. So what happens is that we look through apple, orange, and then when we meet pear, this condition becomes true. And since continue happens, this iteration is skipped and we do not print pair. However, this does not stop the entire for loop and we move on to pineapple and then durian. Next, let's talk about pass. So pass just means do nothing at all. So if we do a pass here, nothing will change and we'll just print every single fruit here. True D and false values. So true D values, they evaluate to true when used as a condition. And false values evaluate to false when used as a condition. So I'm just going to write an example. So if 0 print A, else print B. So right now what's going to happen is that B will be printed because 0 is a false value. However, if we choose a number, let's say 100, A will be printed because 100 is a true D value. So for numbers, 0 is falsy, while any non-zero number is true D. So now let's talk about strings. If we use an empty string, it's falsy and we get B. However, if we use a non-empty string, let's say I have apple here, it is true D and we'll get A. Empty string is falsy and non-empty string is true D. This is also the case for list sets and dictionaries. If they are empty, they are falsy, and if they are not empty, they are true D. So let's say I'm just going to create a list containing 1, 2, 3. So if we run this, we are going to print A because this 1, 2, 3 evaluates as true. However, if we use an empty list instead, this will evaluate as false. Decorators. So a decorator is simply a function that takes in another function and it changes the behavior of the other function that it takes in without actually changing its code. So I'm sure you have seen something like this. Define some function and let's just add a pass here and we have this add something. So this something is known as the decorator function. So let's explore how this works. So first I'm going to define a greet function. So it's going to take in a name and it's going to return hello name. So next, we want to write a decorator function that will add exclamation mark after the return value. So let's do this, add exclamation. If we run this now, it won't work because we need to define this function. So define add exclamation and it takes in our function. So your function and inside this function is another function. So let's just call this wrapper and it takes in ax and quarks. So it returns your function ax quarks and let's add one exclamation mark here and return wrapper. So this line actually does this. This equals to add exclamation greet. And if we were to run this, so we print greet Tom, we will get hello Tom with an additional exclamation mark. Similarly, we can do this multiple times. So let's add three exclamation marks instead. And we will get hello Tom with three exclamation marks behind. So this is how we can change the behavior of a function without actually changing the source code of the function. Generators and yield. So let's define a normal function. So define hello. So uh, return one, 
return 2 and 2 and return 3. So the thing about the return statement is that once it runs, nothing else will run in the function. So we will never ever reach return 2 or return 3. However, let's take a look at yield. So yield 1, yield 2 and yield 3. So you can think of yield as a return statement that doesn't end the function. So we can actually do this for i in hello, and we call hello, we print i, and we will get 1, 2, 3, because 1, 2, 3 is yielded from hello. So because hello uses yield inside, hello is known as a generator function. Try accept blocks. So try accept, and let's add a finally. So in the try block, we can add some risky code that could lead to an error. So this is how the error is handled. And this will run regardless of whether there's an error. So let's try dividing something by 0. So x is equal to 1 divided by 0. So this will lead to a 0 division error. So if there's an error, the accept block will happen. So print error occurs. And in the finally block, as print, this will always run. So let's say if we run this, here we get a zero division error and therefore error occurs is being printed out. However, if we divide by something that is valid, the error occurs will not be printed out. So one way to enhance your accept block is that we can accept exception as e and we can print out the exception. So now let's go back to dividing by zero and we get error occurs division by zero. So pickle is a built-in library in Python that we can use to save Python objects as files. We don't have to pip install it, we can just import pickle. So let's say I have a dictionary I want to save. So apple is 4, orange is 5. So now I want to save D as a file. So with open test.pckl and very importantly, we need to write binary when we are writing to a file. So as f, so pickle.dump essentially saves something to test.pckl. So we dump d inside and let's run this. So once it's finished running, notice that there's this test pckl that appears in the same directory. So now let's comment everything out and let's use pickle to read a file. So with open, same thing, test.pckl. And here we need to rb, which means read binary. This is very important. Read binary as f. And let's have x is equals to pickle.load f. And if we print x, we'll get apple 4 and orange 5. And here we have it. Virtual environments. So a virtual environment is essentially a localized installation of Python in a certain folder that won't affect the other instances of Python. So let's say if I run Python and import sys, sys.executable, I'm going to get my main Python over here. However, right now I'm going to create a virtual environment. So I'm using a Mac, so Python 3-m venv, and I'm going to call my virtual environment env. And if I run this, an uh, env folder will appear, and here we have it. So this env folder is our virtual environment, and right now I'm going to activate this environment. Let me first paste all of the commands here. So right now, I'm going to activate my environment. Source and bin activate. And here, we should see this env thing. So this means that our environment is active. So once again, let's go into Python. Port sys and sys.executable. And notice now that our Python is in this current directory rather than our main Python just now. So the main purpose of virtual environments is actually to localize your Python dependencies so that whatever you install here does not affect our main Python. Next, let's deactivate the environment. So deactivate. And our environment will be deactivated. Basic machine learning. So before I knew how machine learning worked, it seemed like some sort of funny magic to me. But after I learned how it worked, in a way, it was just statistics. So at the very basic level of machine learning, we have supervised learning. Think of it as letting a child practice math questions. And the more he practices, the better he gets at it, and he will perform better in his math tests. So the two most basic supervised learning algorithms are actually linear regression and logistic regression from the sklearn library. So to get started, we simply need to pip install scikit-learn and pip install numpy and pandas, use some sort of training dataset from Kaggle, and we are good to go. Assert, raise, and custom exceptions. So let's start with the assert statement. If we assert true, nothing will happen. But if we assert false, Python will give us an assertion error. So you can think of assert as some sort of sanity test. So let's say we have a score is equals to 75. 
and we want to assert that score is more than equals to zero and score is less than equals to 100 because zero to 100 is the natural range of a test score so let's get rid of this so let's run this again so nothing happens because this evaluates to true our sanity test here evaluates to a true however let's say we make some error and our score is now 750 so if we run this again this will not be true and an assertion error will be thrown next let's consider the raise statement so when we raise an exception we forcefully cause an exception so if we run this this exception will happen because we forcefully raise it and if we add a message here so hello world or something this will reflect in the exception as the error message so similarly if score is less than zero or score is more than 100 we can raise an exception stating that score must range from 0 to 100. So once again, because our score is wrong, this line will run and this exception will be raised. So another more powerful way of doing this is that we can create our own custom exceptions. So let's do that. So class score exception. So here we inherit from the exception class and we pass. So if score is less than zero or more than 100 we raise a score exception so here we can choose to get rid of the message or we can choose not to either way it works so once again if we run this realize that score exception is raised here multi-processing so this is part of the python standard library too so we do not need to install anything so we can simply import multi-processing so let's also import time and date time so firstly, let's define a function. So define your function and it takes in x and it calculates the start time and end time, the time.sleep1 and it returns f string x equals started at start, ended at end. So this function essentially takes in something, calculates the start time and time and then just prints a string containing all of this info. So next we are going to do the multi-processing stuff. So if name is equals to main with multi processing dot pool processors is equals to three as pool. So what this means is that instead of the usual one process, we are going to spawn three processors to run our function. So data is equals to pool dot map your function and let's map to seven inputs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And for row in data print row so let's run this and here we have it so x is 1 is 2 is 3 is 4 is 5 is 6 and 7 so notice the start and end times so the first three are run together the next three are run together and the last one is run on its own mostly because we have three processes so multi-processing is pretty useful if we are doing time consuming stuff such as web scripting and such so thanks for watching and hopefully this was helpful in some way